Imagine a world without managers, where what you do and how you do it is much more important than having someone to telling you how to perform your tasks. As speed and autonomy are the driving forces of successful and productive teams, the value of classical management is significantly challenged. This might sound utopian, but this is happening in organizations all over the world right now. Sasha calls this true organizational agility, where management overhead is eliminated and productivity is instead driven by elegantly designed process management. Sasha is managing partner at Process Renewal Group, and she brings us some real life examples of how self-managed organizations behave. Please give her a warm welcome. Hello. I think um, I really enjoyed all of the three speeches, and um, in fact, the main messages that I heard, actually, I think I'm pretty much done. <laughs> I can just summarize all of those thoughts. Um, but I would like to tell you about the self-management um, organizational structure that um, we're working with lately, and uh, I just want to share all of my lessons learned from it. Um, before I start, by the show of hands, tell me if you have a manager. Super, probably 70%. Keep your hands up, and keep your hand up if you like working with your manager and your manager's manager. Some hands went down. <laughs> okay, so um, there was a survey that was done uh, for uh, why people actually leave organizations, and the top, one of the top reasons of why it is is actually was exactly that, is that there was dissatisfaction with working with, their ma with your manager or manager's manager. So my name is Sasha Gnola. Um, my, me personally, I've been in a business organization space for uh, 20 years. I started working young. <laughs> um, and uh, I've been walking through from, started from business analyst to process analyst to process improvement uh, leader, but I finished my corporate career by, as a director of business architecture, the largest Canadian uh, retailer, um, name is Loblaw. Uh, it actually has uh, more than 130,000 employees uh, within, uh, in Canada. So I am Canadian. Um, if you're hearing the accent, it is actually Russian. I uh, moved to Canada 20 years ago. Uh, and um, I was told it's the happiest place in the world. So uh, hope if you come uh, by and take a look, it is actually still so. Uh, right now, I'm a partner at the uh, Process Renewal Consulting Group. Uh, we are a boutique consulting firm, uh, but done um, more than 100 projects. And what I'm going to share with you uh, is some of the learnings, as I mentioned, by helping the organizations to move or transition. And it's either from some, just how do you organize the work better? How do you reduce the frustration of the employees? Uh, we do start, we have, as a, hence the name, it's a process renewal group. Um, we do take our basis as a process analysis. So we love process models. We think this is the uh, foundation for most of the conversations. Uh, and yet, what we also know that more than 80% of the problems don't come just by just figuring out the process. Uh, mostly, it's very logical to go from stop A to stop B to stop C. Uh, in most of the cases, the problems actually changing comes from all of the other reasons and domains. Cultural, uh, you take the business rules that are not very clear, it is hierarchical problems, it's decision making, and so on. So, the reason I'm really into self-management right now, because we worked with a number of organizations that considered uh, in now transitioning into self-managed organizations. Uh, and I found that, especially based on my previous background, that we're struggling with this maintaining business knowledge constantly maintained. It's almost like we're constantly looking in the rare, big, in the rare seat mirror, because Yes, well, I know I've modeled all of the processes. I have all of the knowledge captured right now. But yet, how is it informing us going forward? Well, most organizations will establish it right now for the project that is coming up, like ERP implementation. 
And then slowly we're losing the interest. We're saying, wow, that would be so great. If next time we would go through something like that, we would have that already. So let's try to maintain it. And we put some governance in, around it and some stewardship of a processing. But of course it starts costing money. And then slowly, slowly, because it's, it is a cost center, our interest get, loses up and goes down. Do you know what I'm talking about, business architects? Thank you. All right. So self-management organization actually overcomes these hurdles, a lot of them, because it's a part of the organization. So in my speech, and I think I'm supposed to have a clicker, I want to cover three main aspects. So I'll start with why, and why was covered before me, but I'll just summarize it a little bit. Um, I'll talk about what it is, what is a self-managed organization, uh, and then I'll talk to you about the um, proposed approach of how to implement it. So, why? Why are companies interested in self-management, and why now? So Evan very well covered that, uh, most of this as well, but I would want to say that a lot of organizations, at least the ones that we're working with, they're saying, we are threatened. We are threatened by the other organizations that act much faster than us, make decisions much faster than us. They have much more innovation. They bring the insights into the product much faster and bring the product much faster to the market as well. So how can we do that? How can we do that for the large organizations? And as well, so when I say large, so we're pretty good, I think, when we are in the companies of up to like 10, 15 people because everybody knows who's doing what, and it's very fast, and they just talk to each other. Now we grow, and I think it's more than 25 people or so. That's where we're starting to duplicate certain things. That's where we start to look for somebody else's opinion on the input and so on. And that's where we're starting to see that duplication and inefficiencies come in. And that's where I'm saying it's really big companies want to act like small companies. So, if you look at the traditional organizations, of course, you would imagine something like this. So what's in the bottom? The bottom is our staff. That's where actual work is happening. Here's the transactions. Here's the things. Here's this, you know, uh, invoices get processed. Here's the material gets out of the door and everything, and everything, and everything. Then we have, if there is any issues or anything like that, we have these managers here. What do the managers do? Planning? What else? What are the managers supposed to do? Anybody? What do you managers do? Oh, is that the answer to my question? <laughs> huh? Coordinate. What else? Measure. What else? Inspire. Very good. I'm sorry? Annoy. Hopefully not any job description, but most likely. Sorry? Share knowledge. Share knowledge. Excellent. Report up, up the stairs. Resourcing. Okay. Remove obstacles. Remove obstacles. Very good. So, yes. And more. Probably your managers do as well. Due to their abilities and capabilities of actually doing that as a manager, um, in the beginning of my career, um, I was uh, a part of the small team that was asked to uh, document all of the processes in the organization. And uh, all I had to do is just to listen, interview, and just basically record everything what, I'm, what, what this individual is doing, what processes this individual is participating in. And uh, one of the last uh, interviews that was within my scope, unfortunately I was given the most fun, I had to interview a CIO. And uh, when I sat down and I said, well, based on our architectural view, you are participating in minimum of these two processes. So like the strategic planning, and then you do the resource planning, uh, and then you also have all like the portfolio, uh, IT portfolio, and so on. And we had no problems of actually validating some of the models I had already with him, and he would say, yes, uh, we also do this and this and that, that from the executive perspective. And that took us about 15 minutes to validate what I had. I came prepared. And then I said, so what else do you do? And he paused. He said, everything that we just spoke to is about probably 40% of my responsibilities covered by these processes. The rest, I'm participating in meetings where I'm just invited 
And yes, my authority will give more weight to a certain decision, but I'm passing the information from one area to another, but it's really no processes that I'm involved in. And that was my like, first aha uh -huh of actually efficiency and also of the cost involved. If he's actually what you would consider, it's only 40% he would be actually you know, costing to the organization. So what is the cost of management? So also, when you describe, so the planning, besides annoying, so that's where my next slide, but everything else, you kind of would think it would make sense if logically you would put around there. So you just would be, you know, if, if these guys are working in day-to-day -day business, then these guys are really dealing with the issues, not letting this they, this, they will only concentrate on their task, everyday task. That's logically. What does actually happen? And how much does this relationship play a part into what actually happens. Who gets promoted further? <laughs> what decisions are made and how? And why? Raise your hand if you recognize at least one of these relationships in your organization. Thank you. So we cannot really look at the just, you know, logical hierarchical relationships without looking at what really happens in here. So I'll bring you another slide, which in my mind is kind of very crisp and logical uh, representation. This is just from the project we just finished. It's a uh, reinsurance company. Uh, the boxes represent the main activities, and then the arrow goes from one activity to another with some of the information that goes one from another. What is this? This is the main information flow of this company. The whole company represented in here, and I love it. Not because we did that, but because I love it because I understand how the business is working, what is actually done, and how information flows. As an engineer who, is li who likes actually working just with a piece of paper, it's very clear for me. I can re-engineer this. I can work with this. I can move it around. I can see why the information is going here and not in multiple places right away, and so on and so forth. But the previous slide with those relationships, of course, is not here. So. When I was thinking about it, well, with a piece of paper, it makes sense. You know, it, it's very easy, but the human factor is not really reflected in there. So I thought, how can I actually represent it, even in my head, what would be that perfect structure that I would be able to work with? And I would represent it in, in this way. If you think of every single task that the organization is doing by the dot, and everything, I mean, day-to-day -day job, there's going to be management, there's going to be supervising, there's going to be planning, there's going to be every single task on just 2D on one, on, one, on one level. Then every single individual would take one or many of those tasks, right, as responsibility. And if you, again, if you engineer, the whole company would be nice and clean, split with every single task engineered and taken care of at least one individual. If you engineer and start from blank, blank uh, page, of course that's what it would be. What happens after that though? The moment we start working, or tomorrow, there are things that happen, new tasks come up, and we very organically start taking care of something else. I cannot pre-engineer, I cannot tell what things are gonna come. We don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. It's really an ecosystem, as it was, as was mentioned before. So what happens now? Well, some of the tasks are double taken by multiple people. Some of them are becoming an orphans. Why? Why would people drop something off? Well, there are only eight hours, allegedly. In North America, nobody works anymore eight hours a day. But there are some of the tasks that either are boring, or they don't see the value in, or just forget, or just there's no more time enough, and there are some other priorities. Some of the tasks, or some of the people start taking, you know, tasks that are a little bit away and off. I'm interested towards certain things, but I'm not sure if it's actually within the mission of overall organization. So it becomes this blob, but very organic blob that as goes and, and lives as we go along. So that's the reason, and I'm going to go to, to that, why self-management was one of the perfect examples of how to take control of everything that happens in a very, very organic, natural way. So 
I brought this up last year, and I think I talk about this in my every single speech, but my favorite quote. True freedom is not the absence of structure, letting the employees go off and do whatever they want, but rather a clear structure that enables people to work within established boundaries in an autonomous and creative way. There are a couple of myths when they say, well, let people go and figure out, and I know like Valve and some other organizations work like that. They hire you, they don't tell you what the new, your roles and responsibilities are. You're supposed to go ahead and try to figure it out yourself. Um, and yet, if you look at their handbook, um, and I think it's only for developers I have to figure out because I still don't know how it would work for accounts payable, clerk, let's say. Um, but they also say the onboarding part is very frustrating. It's frustrating for us to try to find out how do you fit exactly, and it's very, very time consuming. Otherwise, if you actually given, the, given your boundaries, now you have a full flexibility to make it much better and go forward with it. So I want to bring this um, theory of spiral dynamics. The spiral dynamics says that as a human beings, we adapt to every new environment by using and at every next level as we go will be much more complex in using the knowledge of the, el and the elements of the previous models that we've been through. What I want to argue we, as within the organizations, we kind of go doing through, going through the same patterns. There are multiple new models, new sexy ways of dealing, doing, with the, doing business. There's different organizational structures. We're going from more automation to less automation. We're going from, uh, from cost savings and efficiencies. We want to concentrate on customer service. There always will be something. There will always will be new, new ways, new spirals of doing things and, and, and changing it. But what there is at the core, really, or in the middle, this is a main that business process, that's what I showed you before in, in the uh, reinsurance company, it still always stays the same. We still manage to push that main product out of the door. No matter what is actually happening, we have very often the culture of heroes who will still figure it out. We'll still figure out how to do it on time. And yet at the same time, we have all of these other turbulent things that are coming onto us. And we're trying to maintain all of the different and try it and, and put out, take our learnings from a previous spiral into the next one. But the core stays the same. And if we're very strong in that spinal cord, it doesn't matter what else is coming up because we know what it is. And that's going back again to the, as it points to the overall structure in, in keeping the architecture uh, steady. So what? What is a self-management and um, where is best suited? So here's an example. How would self-managed organization look like or, uh, uh, during the day? So first of all, and the mainly what self-managed is known for is that in a self-managed organization, there are no bosses at all. Mission is the boss, but it's completely, completely flat. So the day of the technician would look something like that. Technician comes in in the day, he knows what he needs to do. He goes through his, his own priorities. The reason he knows what needs to be done, it's either by the plan and priorities that he set by the previous time or by the individual who's responsible to do that planning and prioritization. Not the supervisor, but somebody else who is just responsible to do that. He also has a very good set of KPIs. Self-managed organizations are obsessed with KPIs. Everything is measured and everything is measurable. And he goes with uh, his day from one task to another, would participate in the meeting, like, uh, for example, if they would make a decision to buy uh, new equipment, so he would provide his input. And there would be also another meeting where there was a dispute between the other colleagues, and he would provide his input in there as well to actually resolve uh, this uh, current situation. Again, no supervisors, obsessed with, uh, with KPIs, obsessed with the work and with his own responsibilities. The other thing that I also want to mention, going back to the continuous improvement piece and the ownership of the changes, it is a change if it's something that this individual needs to do for his or her work, would actually own the change by himself, or if they notice something that is happening, like for example in the factory, something else is going on, but it's not within my responsibilities, every single colleague is absolutely responsible to find the owner and then give that issue away. Until that individual says, yes, I'm committed now to solve that problem, this problem is actually solved and I'm still owning it. So, 
my main knowledge of uh, self-management as well as we go ahead and we uh, learn more and we adjust as we go every single time is from uh, Morningstar. Anybody heard about Morningstar? Excellent. Uh, an organization based in California, uh, Morningstar is the largest tomato processor in the world. Uh, they've been self-managed company since 1990. Without a single boss, over 400 employees, over 4,000 seasonal workers, and revenues is just under $1 billion. Anybody who ever came to North America, 100% they had Morningstar products. It's either in the ketchup or in the pasta sauces or in the soups and so on and so forth. The largest tomato processor. So Morningstar um, supplies approximately 40%. And the founder of it, he started with the two main principles in mind. Because he came in and said, listen, I don't think that what we're doing, if we would do the traditional way, is really working the way I want it to. It's not very humane. And he started with the two core principles. And every single thing that they actually do, all of the behavioral descriptions as you, as you write them, and the principles of how this company works, are founded on these two main principles. Number one, human beings should not use force or coercion against other human beings. Anybody have any things to say that would not be true <laughs> anywhere else? So all of the HR policies actually are based on these foundational principles. And the people should honor the commitments that they make to each other. And this is one of the absolutely core differences between some of the traditional organizations that we have versus this one. So every commitment is actually measured. If I gave you commitment, meaning I promise I'm going to give you this report by the end of tomorrow, I must fulfill my commitment. And that's such a big mindset difference between most of the organizations I've been a part of or worked with other than their self-managed organizations. This is really, really ingrained. So, quick question. Do you know what this is? What could it be? Network activities. Anything else? The system? It's actually an organizational chart of, North, of Morningstar. Every dot is an individual. Every connection is just the commitment that they gave to each other. And it goes, and it grows, and it changes. But that's how it looks like. So some of the other descriptions of a, of a self-managed organization. So all of those things that you mentioned about uh, what managers would do, it's actually responsibility of every single individual, of every single colleague. That's all what it is. Self-management does not mean there is no management. It just means it's not managers. People at Morningstar are compensated a little higher than their colleagues in the other organizations, even similar tomato, uh, tomato companies. That 15% over is actually to compensate for those management responsibilities. Because not everybody who's actually joining an organization will say, oh, I'm supposed to look at this at the, and learn how, how planning works, or how uh, um, budgeting is. Actually, they have the rolling, rolling planning, they don't have a budget. Uh, but you have to be able, and they teach you how to do it if you don't have the current skill. So everyone is a manager, and everyone has an equal voice that impacts what they do. Sometimes decisions take longer just because they want to get the input of all of the employees that are actually involved in a certain decision making. Do not need seek permission, and leadership is earned. There are business units, of course, right? But the leaders is not told that you're a leader, so that's why having a power of now dictate what are you doing. Vice versa, it's actually, there's natural leaderships that get born um, for those things of motivating or, um, you know, at certain, so still saying, well, let's figure it out. There's still certain things and leadership qualities, but come up, as I said, naturally. Nobody dictates start A and stop B. Nobody can fire you, but almost everybody can hire an individual. Um, requires active communication that requires initiative, and people have to keep their scorecards absolutely as a must thing. I've never ever seen number of scorecards of KPI, bo or KPI boards as I see in self-managed organizations. What do the KPIs need? Or definition of KPIs? You need to be able to know what you're trying to measure. And is that the right measure? Where does it come from? From business architecture. And that's how it actually becomes 
and evolves and keeps being up to date all every single time. Now, um, a quick exercise. Um, you, don't, you don't need to talk, but I would like for you to find a partner. It's going to be like a two second exercise, honestly. Just a partner, just two of you. Turn around, find another person, another individual. It's going to be very, very quick. It's not going to hurt, honestly. Just two of you. Um, one of you is a person A, another one is person B. Person A, can you raise your hand, please? A? Awesome. Keep that hand up. All I'm asking you to do, person A, put together with the person B, just hands just like that. One next to each other. Awesome, thank you. Person A, please push towards person B. Thank you. Can you release now? Notice, I did not ask the person B to do anything. What was your natural reaction? Push back. Resist. You're still holding hands. Very good. I don't know if it's B you're talking. <laughs> you're still like, <laughs> awesome. So there is a natural reaction. Sometimes it's our ego that talks back, right? I'm going to the command and control kind of thing. So every single individual reacts differently to command and control, even to just normal and usual feedback that we have, right? Quick other exercise. Person A, please just extend your hand in a handshake to the person B. Person B, you can go ahead and react how you would react. <laughs> or props, give each other props. Very different, isn't it? And you didn't have to try to figure out what it is. But what I'm saying is now it's based on the commitment, and sorry, on the agreement, on the agreement between you two. It's a different mindset right away. It didn't tell you, hey, you must do this. It's vice versa. Let's negotiate. Let's see how to figure it out better. And let's negotiate the commitments. If I'm saying I cannot do the, give you a report by the end of the day, I can give you only tomorrow, but you still need it today. Let's figure out how we can split it. Maybe there are a couple of different things how we can do that. Very different mindset. Now, I have to tell you, self-management does not work for every single organization. And I think I'm jumping, so I'll come back to that. <laughs> so, a couple of things that for self-managed organization work um, the processes are more critical than in other organizations. Things like recruit talent in a self-managed organization takes much, much longer than in traditional organizations. In Morningstar, it takes more than three months to hire one colleague. Not too many organizations can afford it, but then they have to figure out what to do. It's better than having a loss by working with somebody you do not want to work or does not have or will not be able to fulfill commitments as, as, uh, as I described before. Set up and maintain contractual relationships. A huge process by itself, as I mentioned, but this is actually as you set up those relationships and as, I, as you set up those commitments and the KPIs, that's where you maintain the knowledge, the business knowledge, and make sure everything is aligned. And I'll come back to that in my, in my next uh, section. Monitoring personal and business performance and act accordingly, every single person's responsibility. And the tools are much more advanced than the other organizations to be able to measure. And actually, it's very accessible, to, it's very transparent. Every single colleague can see anybody else's KPIs. Uh, it's used on the boards or on the, uh, on the KPI system that they're using. Making decisions, very important as well. It's a component decision making in the most of the cases. What I mean by that, instead of actually making one big decision, we're taking a decision into a small components to separate it and bring it to as low as possible to the, or I mean, the closest to the transaction as possible. Recognize and reward self and peers. Nobody's gonna tell you you're doing a good job. It's only yourself. Or you could tell the other people, good job. Why? Because you've seen the KPIs, because it was a great and successful day. But nobody can actually, uh, uh, you know, tell you, watch out. But you can question. Every single individual can question. So that's what's very interesting is also, instead of actually one manager saying, hey, uh, let's take a look at task A and the way it's done, and I think there are some issues, every single individual actually working and working with you, they actually can question your decision making. Um, and uh, resolve conflicts. Again, one of the interesting uh, descriptions of this type of organization is a very direct and open communication. Uh, and uh, resolving conflicts is, uh, in a lot of cases, um, becoming a very interesting process and it's a well-established process by itself. Now, 
As I mentioned, um, self-managed organizations are not for everybody. Tried to talk, I did actually, we tried to talk uh, about self-management to uh, some of the banks in Canada. Um, I would not recommend to talk about it to any of the government organizations, um, again, at least in, in Canada or states, uh, quite dangerous for your health. Um, but I do think that certain types of the organizations are predisposed. And what I mean by predisposed is actually it will be much more open. So uh, organizations like a software design, I know quite a few that are going forward with that or even starting up, and that's what uh, the third bullet, it's if, if you're starting the organization like that, not transitioning, because transitioning, it's already, there's a command and control, and a lot of people like being, of course, in, a, uh, in that management position and the, man in the position of power and tell and dictate people what to do. And that's why there's a lot of casualties as you go through the transformation, uh, and a lot of people would leave this type of organizations. Millennial majority, um, I did quite a bit of study and uh, uh, wrote an article in Huffington Post, was, was uh, posted as well, um, to talk about the millennial current issues in the organizational, of actually working of traditional, of uh, previous generations with the, with the millennials. And uh, we do think that the uh, organizations with the majority of millennials uh, are much more um, attracted to this type of organizations. Um, and leading embrace, so what we also have is really some of the organizations say, well, it's very difficult for the whole organization to change, but there is a small group of, or a smaller division, or even the branches, let's say, at the bank, that say, yes, we do accept, we would like to uh, just transition one part, and the leader is ready to give up that ownership, that uh, power, that, uh, that place of power. So leader embraced and no desire for more power. So how, um, a million dollar question, um, how do you actually transition uh, uh, self-management? Uh, in this uh, approach that I'm gonna show you, so it was developed uh, by Doug Kirkpatrick. He's actually a founder uh, of self-managed theories, um, published a number of books uh, about it and did the TED Talks and keeps talking about it around the world uh, for now more than 15 years. Um, so what Doug is proposing and here is the uh, approach that we would take with any organization. We would start with a commitment, so really, how far, how deep do you actually want to go forward? Um, then there's an open space uh, phase where actually every, it's actually open space, so it's around tables um, and people are speaking up uh, and that's where we extract all of the cultural predisposition, what works, what does not work uh, for this organization. Then it's a master class. It's actually three day of feeling what is, how would it be uh, to live and go um, to, to actually operate in this type of environment as a self-management. Um, infrastructure, I'm going to talk about infrastructure in the next few slides uh, to go in detail, but this is establishment of that uh, business knowledge. Next is the contract development. So once you developed it, now you have to assign for that one individual. Uh, and then we're celebrating the contracts that we're signing and we're deciding to go forward and the last type of sustainment, one of the most difficult part of any change, is just to make sure that we're still going ahead, it's still aligned, we're not going just, oops, there's a swamp, and we're going, going back down to as was, uh, but it is actually within uh, sustaining what we wanted to achieve. In the next few slides, as I mentioned, I just want to go back a little bit into the business architecture. Now, this is uh, nuts and bolts <laughs> for, for those of you who, who like this stuff. I'm sure you'll, you'll enjoy a few things that I'm gonna show. So going back to that core, core business, that's what we're saying. We want to establish that core business very, very strong so that we can use it for the uh, agreements, for the colleague agreements. Three steps. One, we collect, connect, and align all of the elements. Two, we review for completeness and orphan processes so nothing is actually staying apart and prepare personal and overall organizational infrastructure. Quick reminder in terms of how many domains, and I'm gonna show you in two slides how many more domains there are, uh, but we for sure need to be aware and collect all of the knowledge that the organization has about all of these domains. We need to know the organization, all of the purposes of the, of the strategy, what is there, everything that we can collect on the policies, on the infrastructure, how many how many factories do we have? What equipment do we run? Um, technology, what is supporting all of the um, software services and applications and the data that is there? 
as well as the people, right? So what is the competency right now? Motivation, current motivation and capacity. So the reason I want to show you next slide, because of course every single thing that we want to connect, now we need to, once we collected that, we need to understand how they all interconnect. And these are just a few, hopefully you can say that, see that, but this is just the relationships. Of course, every single process, have process steps, how it's connected to the role, how the role is what is connected to the KPIs and what KPI targets are we driving, as well as every single role would have a skill in the behaviors and the skill in the behaviors, we need to make sure that we have the proper certification to the process, proper process step that again goes back to the role. So every single thing is interconnected. Lots of work <laughs> for a couple of people. But why do we do this? So that we eliminate that frustration that might come later on. If somebody engineers and pre-thinks about it and thinks of all of the decisions that need, to, that need to be made, it makes it easier for the next step because there will be more dots. Every single day there will be more dots that come in and they will make a decision later on but they don't have to be frustrated with what's happening right now. This is even more complicated, right? So I showed you in the previous slide just a few. This is in complexity further. So if you want to ensure that every single thing is connected, you have to understand. You have to understand and know that every single agreement is going to hold the water and it makes sense. Next, so step number two. Sorry, I didn't know how to represent it better, but that's what I'm trying to say. Now you just have to make sure that nothing is still somewhere on the side or somebody is doing something that is not within the mission. There are no orphans. There are still tasks that are not assigned and so on. And then the next step is really going back to that one individual, to that one role. So if this is one role, and these are my tasks, I want to know what other people am I talking to? What is my commitment to the other ones? If there are any SLAs there, how do I describe it? And so on, how many people do I need to involve into certain decisions? And so on and so forth. And that's where that agreement and negotiation happens. So a few steps when I put the agreement together. I know the personal infrastructure the intent and the personal mission. I know the personal responsibilities, what are the tasks in there. Decision-making authority, what can and cannot I decide? Or who do I need to involve into the decision-making? And the fourth, reflect results per responsibility. So again, near-term results, and actually what they do, it's an ideal. If it's, a, if it's an error rate, then my ideal state is zero. And I'm right now, let's say, at, at uh, 20%. So what is my ideal state? It's not really in year terms and so on. My closing thought is basically what is very interesting and what we're struggling with or what on all of the other organizations is this constant struggle between how much governance do we put in, how much efficiency do we want versus the employee engagement. What is really coming up in, in multiple organizations and self-managed organizations, especially in the Morningstar because I know it so well, is that the engaged and efficient and highly motivated people, it's a really different atmosphere when you work. It's really nice to work with people that are happy to come to the place and own their own responsibilities. They know their own KPIs and the more it feels like they're more in balance, if I may say, with their own personalities and, and again with their own inner balance, if I may say. Thank you. You, thank you, Sasha. Uh, we'll be happy to take some questions from the audience. Um, I have such a question. Yes. Um, so these people are making commitments to each other. Yes. Multiple people to mul multiple other people, multi many to many, many relationships. To many. And how to ensure that you know people are people? So that nobody abuses this situation. Nobody actually makes advantage of other people making commitments to me as opposed to me kind of not being very active to make commitments to other people. So in every society there are such individuals and such trends. So how to do these new structures uh, to prevent these abusive behaviors of, yeah. of participants? Awesome question. A couple of things that works, especially at, at uh, Morningstar as well. Number one, as you said, it's many to many. 
So if somebody is not taking enough, anybody can question and say, listen, it doesn't seem right. And anybody can question the amount of work that is completed. Second thing, there's also structural work that happens. So as I mentioned, there is a re of, I didn't mention actually, there's this re of colleague agreements that is done at least twice a year. That's where all of the KPIs and all of the work is done into realigning and reconnecting. And it's also work assessment that is completed. They want to make sure that everything that you have can be done within the proper eight hours or within the hours that you assigned. And if it's more or less, there are a lot of graphs, tons of graphs to figure it out, then it's also with the question, can you take something else on? So who is doing these assessments? Is, does that mean that there actually is some kind of overseeing power which does these assessments? It's not overseeing. It's just analysis on top of what it is. They cannot tell they cannot tell you what else to do, what not. They would question it. And there would be, as I said, nobody can fire you. However, there are people in the worst situations that people were questioning and bringing the conflicts up. And an individual just became so uncomfortable that it actually would leave. There's a certain disciplinary thing, but there's nobody who's overseeing what it is. Same as, as you would do as a process, any continuous improvement and so on, or tell, well, now we need to do things differently. It's more of an advisory in informing what needs to be done. And they would actually go back to you and mention and take a look and reassign the tasks within the teams. Engineer, it's like you know, on a piece of paper, and then you take it back to personalities. But what is very interesting, again, because we have in, you know, uh, uh, all agreements in who to hire. So within the uh, interviewing process, it's actually every single individual who will be working with you must say, yes, we want to work with you on the ongoing basis. So it's like Alcoholic Anonymous. We basically are continuing to work with you because we want to be a success going forward because I have to work, be able to work with you on the, on the ongoing basis. Thank you. Other questions? Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm wondering if I'm uh, looking at uh, processes from a self-managed uh, company, what would I see what I don't see in a not self-management uh, company? So how, how can you look at processes and recognize if it's self-managed? Um, so process maps would be, uh, depending how you depict them and see the process map. So um, it's either you would assign the role or not. Uh, there are no titles in process management, there's only name of the process. Uh, there will be a little bit less of interaction on going, you know, back and forth. Um, that's definitely would be the case. Um, if you look at the process uh, description or definition where it says step A, step B, um, escalate and then come back. So it would be just a little bit less of that. As I said, decision making is just you breaking one decision into smaller components. So it would be within, um, uh, within the tasks. Um, other than that, uh, as I said, those critical processes, much more and better defined. Um, so again, as a recruitment, as a monitoring, uh, because usually if I start doing a business architecture for uh, any you know, organization, I would say, okay, and there's an HR function over here, let me go to APC, uh, AQPC and then just get how to hire, and this would be applicable to pretty much any organization, right? So not in this organization, as I mentioned. So conflict resolutions, um, hiring uh, agreements, setting up a KPI will be just most, much more explicit uh, in self-managed organizations. If I didn't know, um, but we usually would know right, in, uh, right in, in the beginning when you actually setting up and saying, well, I wanna talk to you then in most of the organizations, well, you're gonna talk to a manager, you're gonna talk to VP and so on. No titles, no titles whatsoever. All right, final question before the next talk. Hi, I'm just referring back to that slide with the process of how you actually um, make the contracts and things. So if I've understood it correctly, is it um, just a way of doing agile operations? It is, so when we're talking about agile, and I'm very a bunch of line we worked with, uh, uh, with Evan, on, so on, we discussed with Evan, but now we're actually working on agile organization as well. So that's why it's actually my organization was called process-centric organization. So a lot of principles would be exactly the same, except so when we, t we can apply process-centric even with, to the hierarchy as well, not necessarily into the flat organization, but pretty much the steps, I would think, would be a lot the same, but just different flavor, if and I may so say. Now, on that basis, does it lend itself more to people that do manufacturing than customer 
service delivery? No, I think it would apply to anybody. Now we have examples of the companies that would apply cool. throughout. Thanks. Okay. Thank All you right, thank you very much.